I just want to say a couple of things before I preach about my tour. This is my 12th trip. My tours are one day longer than most tour companies. I, I tuck in another day there. And um, it's my 12th time there. I say Israel's my second home. You know, when I'm in Israel, I feel at home. I feel at home with the Jewish people. Uh, and um, so I have the tour to Israel. For those that want to do I'm doing a three, four day extension to Greece. That's an add-on. You don't have to do it, but it's an add-on if you want to go to Greece um, as well. And if you are interested, I'll say one other thing. Uh, a number of people I send out either a picture or something about Israel once a week, and, and I'll keep doing that to November. If you want to be on that list, just give me your email at the end of the service, and, and I'll put you on that list. That doesn't commit you. It doesn't mean that you're coming, for sure, but it kind of helps inform you have any questions. So anyway, um, I want to speak this morning on Jesus' mission, exciting and challenging. Do you feel that about the mission that God has for you, that it's exciting and it's challenging? God wants it to be challenging. It's so sad that, you know, in many churches, the journey of the Christian life is one of boredom. God never intended the Christian life to be boring. And I think you people in the Cinnaboy Apostolic Church, you know, and you don't live in that realm of boredom. You know, Pastor Terry's not there, and, and he's led you in that way that the Christian life's never to be boring. You know, um, I, I, just, I say this to people. If you want to be challenged, read the Gospels and see how Jesus lived his life. As you read the Gospels, Jesus was never boring. And what he did was never boring. It was exciting. He was doing miracles and he was challenging people. Uh, I like Philip Yancey uh, because Philip, I don't know if you read many of his books, but Philip Yancey's kind of a, a Christian writer that, that kind of challenges the borders <laughs> of the Christian faith. He, he constantly has challenged the borders. And, and he said in his book, um, The Jesus I Never Knew, he said, two words could never apply to Jesus of the Gospels. Boring and predictable. <laughs> he said, they couldn't apply. You know, I, I, I thought this too several times. We know young people that have gone from Canada and even other countries, and they've gone and joined ISIS. Why have young people joined ISIS? You know why they've joined? They're looking for something that's challenging and exciting. We have something as a Christian church that's challenging and exciting. And they can get involved with serving Jesus and do more and exciting things and, and good things than people join ISIS. And we just need to lead our young people in that direction. Um, we all need to be motiva motivated in sharing Jesus in a non-pressured, non-threatening way. Really, I, I, just, I want to challenge you today. You need to be motivated in sharing Jesus. And how are you doing in that? You know, let it be a, a natural flow out of your life. You know, there's a young man, he's an addictions counselor at the jail, and I met him because I've gone and, and done a workshop about every six weeks. I'd go up to the jail and do a workshop with the addictions group. Anyway, I built a relationship with him, and this one day I was having lunch, this was about two years ago. And, and I got talking, and he's still single at the time, but he had started going with this girl. And, and I, I, I don't know how it came up, but I said that, you know, my son and his wife were married for four years, and they didn't have any babies. If you're married for four years and not having babies, I wonder what's going on with the couple. So I said to my son, you know, uh, help me understand. He loves kids. Help me understand why you and your wife don't have any kids. He said, Dad, I don't think will ever have kids because there's some kind of female problem with his wife. You know, when he said that, I felt really, really sad. I felt like he's sticking a knife in me. Not that I'd be sad they don't have more grandchildren because I have two in the States, but I would be sad that he couldn't enjoy being a dad. So I'm telling this to this young guy. He's not a Christian. I'm saying, you know what? So I said, I started praying for my son. And I said, then I was at a meeting this one time and we were gathered in this prayer and there was like four of us praying. Uh, and, and at the end of the prayer time, the one guy said to me, you know what, I feel like your son and his wife will have a baby, but it'd be like an Isaac. Now, he doesn't know any details. When he says, be like an Isaac, I think, that's a word from God. 
They will have a son. They will have a child. And, and the second thought comes, it will be a boy. Would you believe the following August, they had a baby boy. So, you know, I'm sharing this to this young man, and his eyes are kind of bugging out. That's the natural flow of what's happening in my life. Let it be natural. You know, uh, sometimes, I just think like sometimes with the evangelism that we do on certain nights, it's not natural. This is a natural thing. Let me just tell a little bit more about this guy, and his name is James. So, when he got married last August, and he was... He was married to a girl who was Catholic, and, and he's not Catholic. He was marrying a girl who was Catholic. He wanted me involved, so I was involved in his wedding. And then I had lunch with him in December. And, and he had told me, like, when we get married, we wanna, I want my wife to get pregnant right away. That was the agreement they want. And she wasn't pregnant. I said, James, I'll start praying for her. I'll pray that, that your wife gets pregnant. So I was in Africa speaking at a pastor's conference in January. I come back in March to have lunch with the game. I said, James, is your wife pregnant? He said, yes, she's pregnant. <laughs> and and uh, then he said, pray. He's, he's telling me this. Pray, he said, that she won't lose it. She's in the first trimester. Pray that she won't lose it. I said, James, I'll pray that she won't lose it. So I prayed that prayer. And then I met him in June because I'm leaving and I'm going to stay in touch with James because he's going to become a Christian. Uh, he's, he's, so I talked to him again. He said, you know what? Um, th they want to do tests to see that the fetus and everything is okay and, you know, how, what the system is. If it's not okay, will you abort it? And he said, um, you know what? I I've done some really bad things in my life. And he, and he said, um, you know, I I'm worried that this baby won't be okay. Because what I did, I said, James, you don't know the heart of Jesus. You don't know Jesus' heart. Jesus' heart is, is to bless you. Jesus' heart is to bless you, James. Don't live with that. Live with the joy of being an expectant father. I said, live with that joy. You know? And his wife's having a baby in November, and I'm keep in touch. But I just want to say, I, I got, I've been able to impact just by sharing my journey. And then he opens up and says, pray for me. And he's still not a, a Christian. <laughs> but he believes there is a God in heaven. And he believes that you can pray. And that God in heaven will answer. You know what? Um, uh, this, I'm not going to read for lack of for the time, for the time. But my scripture passage I'm taking today is from Matthew 9th chapter. And 9 to 17. Now just a little bit of setting to Matthew 9. The population at that time in Palestine and uh, Israel in that area, country that's known as Israel today was Palestine then. It was two and a half to three million people. And, um, and there was many towns and cities around about Jerusalem. But every, about three times a year, Jesus would come up to Jerusalem. And Jesus also come and he ministered to people in the town. But the interesting thing is, I find that... Um, Verses 9 and 10 is really interesting. Verse 9 says, And Jesus said to him, Matthew, and this is Matthew the tax collector. Okay, verse 9, it's on the screen. If you want to have Matthew 9, 9, if you want to put it up, because I'm going to go to the next verse in a second. Um, and I'm using from the New King James if, if you have a certain kind of a version. It's a, anyway, and Jesus said to him, and the tax collector, follow me, and he rose and followed him. It's the 10th verse that I want us to look at. Because here's what it says. As Jesus sat at the table in the house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Here's Jesus. And who's coming? The tax collectors and sinners. Now, why are the tax collectors and sinners coming to Jesus? Did he compromise on who he was? I don't think so. You know, I hear today well, because I'm so spiritual, people don't want to be around me. No, no, I say there's something else. Because you're so religious, people don't want to be around, around you. When you have the life of Jesus flowing in you, people want to be around you. People come and sat with Jesus. Tax collectors, that's the worst of the worst. And sinners, they sat with him. Because they felt comfortable. What I want to say to you this morning, as a Christian, you can have 
unbelievers that will feel comfortable with you as you won't be religious and share the good stuff that's happening in life and share some of the struggles as well. You know what? They'll feel comfortable with you and they'll open up their heart and I'll ask you a lot of questions, either about their home or about their marriage, about their family, whatever. They will ask you and that's your doorway in, a natural doorway in to share the gospel. It's natural. And, you know, and, and I will knock any evangelism program, but a lot of evangelism Evangelism programs are not natural. This is natural. Think of the ways. For all of you here this morning, think of the ways that are natural for you to go and share the gospel. Natural. Okay. You know, I uh, did a wedding in Regina yesterday, and I'm sitting beside the, the manager of Regina Funeral Home, Jeff Weaver. Uh, and, you know, and he opened up his heart and he shared with me. And, and um, you know, and he shared this, like, on the graveside. People were, ministers, will try to push the gospel on him, you know. And, and he's in the process. He's in the process. But he did not feel good with how they were pushing the gospel on him. Wrong way to do it. I said to him, I said, Jeff, you know, because he has, I'm not going to tell other stuff he told me because it's kind of personal. But I said, Jeff, you know what? Find a church that, that's not religious, I said. I said, you go around, find a church that's not religious, where you feel you can meet God in a meaningful way. I said, find that kind of church in Regina. I want to say, go to Regina. But, but I didn't tell him that. I mean, no, no, I just don't want to force it. He might end up there. But you know what? I just want to come and know God in a personal way. But as I sat uh, at that table, you know, at the reception, I had a time to talk to him. I had such a good, good talk about him, and he's going through some struggles in his life. You know what? Let it be natural. You know, and all of you have contact with people this week. All of you will have. What's the natural thing that you can do? Because Jesus sat with these tax collectors and sinners, and they felt comfortable with him. So how can we exemplify Jesus to the pre-Christian? Don't be judgmental. Don't be judgmental. And Pastor Terry told me a wonderful story about this church. I'm not going to share it this morning, but it was really good. I was really proud of you when he told me about a situation of someone. But don't be judgmental. The Christian community is far too judgmental. You know what? For you in this body, you don't judge others that are in this body. You know what you do? You love on them. For people in this town, you don't judge them. You love on them. We're called to love, we're not called to judge. You know, and then so people, ones that are turned away because we're so judging. You know what? And we just need to be authentic. Be real. Okay? And, and being authentic is just being real and being trustworthy and not phony. What are some things that, that make for us being authentic? Well, Honesty. You know, honest, honesty with ourselves and with others. Um, living a lie does not bring respect. I know I'm going to say this. Couples I give premarital to, I will say to the couple in the process, one of the things I do is um, I say to the guy, if your fiancé goes and buys a nice outfit and comes to you with it, um, I said, and she asks you about it, are you going to, what are you going to do? Are you going to make her feel good or are you going to be honest? Guess what the guys say most of the time? I'm going to make her feel good. I say, you lose. <laughs> you lose. It's not about making her feel good at that point in time. It's about being honest. Because you know what? If you're honest, now she might, if you said, it's a little too tight around the middle, or whatever you said, she might be upset with you for the moment. But you know who she's going to take shopping with her three weeks from now when she goes? She's taking you because you built something in relationship. Honesty. I just want to say to all of you that are here this morning, be honest with your spouse when they ask you. Be honest with someone else in the church. You know, sometimes you can't get a proper answer. You, you ask someone something and you know that they fudged on the answer. If someone asks you, you be honest. Be authentic. You know, part of being authentic is... is, is Letting people know that, you know what? You do have a fight with your wife at times, or your husband. <laughs> you do have a fight. 
you do have times where you struggle. You maybe struggle with your kids, and you're struggling with your teenagers and what they're doing. Or you struggle with lust or, or whatever you're struggling with. That's being real. That's being authentic. You know what? We kind of create this religious illusion that we're so perfect. We Christians aren't so perfect. We're forgiven, but we're not so perfect. Are we? I don't think we are. <laughs> I don't think we are that perfect. So we just need to be, we just call it like it is. You know what? The pre-Christian can relate to us because we don't just talk about the good stuff, but we also talk about our struggles. And we do have struggles. But we create the illusion that we don't have struggles. And we do. No. So when we're that, we, we, we open the door for that. Jesus, a wonderful example of, of being authentic. The process of being authentic is, is just being more like Jesus. Philippians 2.5 says, your attitude should be the same as it was in Christ Jesus, as he laid down as he gave his life to others. I want to say the more spiritual church becomes, the more outreaching it becomes in the community. Being spiritual doesn't mean you close in. It means you reach out. Jesus said, I come to seek and to save those that which are lost. And I pray that it burns in your heart. Even this day as you would leave this service. God, you came to seek and save the lost. And I want to be part of that process. I want to be the one that can share the good news. And see people come in your kingdom. I want to be that kind of person. God, help me not just to be complacent. Help me not just to be a Sunday morning Christian where I go to church Sunday and do the, Christ, the Sunday thing. But God, give me a passion for those that are lost. Give me a passion. I pray even now as I'm speaking, I pray that God will put a passion in your heart. A passion for the lost. Not to go out the streets, but use in your, just who you are. Just be that to other people. And God will open doors for you. I just believe this. As you pray this week, God will open doors for you where you have a chance to share maybe something that God did. That's all you share. You don't need to share anything else. But, but they're listening. That's interesting. God did that for him or for her. That's interesting. You know what they're doing? They're catching on. To, that you're, it's bait. It's spiritual bait in a godly way because they, they want to know more about God did that for you. You know, in Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 13 says, you are the salt of the earth. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. That's very interesting. The Bible says you are. It doesn't say that you might be or you could be, but you are the light of the world. You are light this morning. You know, and we just let our light shine. We let the life of Jesus flow through us to others. And it impacts them. The two illustrations of salt and light express the same function that needs to be up for us as Christians. The importance of influence in the world. The importance of influence in the world. You know, I'm going to say this. This is one thing that bugs me with the Christian church at large. No, it really does. We are too aloof to an any world. That really bugs me. And I'm saying in a general sense, we're too aloof to an any world. You know, we, we call from our lofty heights and say, people come to where I'm at. No, no, we need, Jesus was always among the people. You know what? He didn't call from some high ivory tower, but he come and he walked among the people. He walked among the hurting. He walked among all those whose lives were messed up. He was walking among them. And he wasn't judgmental. But because he walked among them and, and they felt comfortable with him, guess what? Guess what? Then he could speak into their life. You know, the adulterous woman is such a wonderful example. If you heard of someone in this town that had adultery, what would you do? Or what would you say? Really, what would you do or say to the fellow Christian in the church or to them or to whoever? And, and you, know, you all know the story. I didn't go over the story. But Jesus never beat on her. He never put her down. But what did he say? Go and sin no more. 
And he got to go on the right track. And that's so important. Witnessing is not a, a job to be done, but a life to live. Remember that. Witnessing is not a job to be done, but a life to be lived. And I just pray that, that everyone in this church, that will be part of how you live your life. It's just about sharing Jesus. In everyday life, does our life display God's character? Does it display his faithfulness? Does it display his love? Jesus' mission, I come to seek and save those that were lost. Luke 19.10, I come to do that. You know, I just want to say that, um, you know, that's Jesus' mission, and because we're Jesus' followers, that's our mission, right? That's our mission. You know, the trick of the enemy, though, is to get us living religiously and self-righteously. We constantly have to fight the religious part that wants to come on us. I just really believe we have to keep fighting that religious part. Um, you know, uh, I had a man about three months ago phone me from Ontario, and he's struggled with smoking. He used to live in Regina, and he smoked then. And this is like 10 years later, and guess what? He's still smoking. Anyway, he, he met some woman, and she said, if you don't quit smoking, guess what? You're going to hell. He said, I want to ask you, if I can't quit my smoking when I go to hell, I said, no. It's not about whether you smoke or not. He's a Christian. You won't go to hell. But see, there's a, there's a Christian putting legalism. Should you quit smoking if you're a smoker? Yes, for your health's sake. If you're overeating, should you quit overeating? Yes, for your health's sake. And so on. You know, yes, but you put in the right perspective. See, but that's legalism. That doesn't draw people to the Lord. It draws them away. You know, th this is, um, you know, so we can be so filled with biblical truth. And we need biblical truth. I'm very much, for you that know me, I think you need to live by biblical truth and live by biblical standard. But we can be full of biblical truth, but isolated from the needy world. That's really sad. You can be a Bible scholar here today. And that's wonderful if you're a Bible scholar. But if you're isolated from the needy world, things are really out of whack in your life. Really out of whack. Because we're, we're to be Jesus' follower and we're to come and seek and save those are lost. We're to pursue after those that are lost. So when it comes to living out our life and sharing the good news, I just want to say, and maybe some of you have got you uptight, you just need to relax. Relax. Okay, some of you just need to relax now. <laughs> you know, yeah, I just, I got you kind of worked out. But just relax. Okay, you know, that's, that's the first thing. Come from a place of rest and relaxation if you want to share the good news. Okay? Be who God made you to be. Okay? How I share Jesus and how you share Jesus will be different ways because we're different personalities. Okay? You don't have to be like me. And I don't have to be like you in sharing the good news. So we just share just how God made us. But, but we need to be sharing. We need to be witnessing. We're called to be witnesses, okay? We need to be doing that. You know, we can think of David and Goliath and, you know, and how that, uh, they want to give David all this armor and David said, this is not me. Uh, take, let's take this stuff off. <laughs> this is not me, you know? What was him? A sling and five stones, that's David. And that did the trick because that was David and that's what he needed. So you know what? Don't look at in, the, in this building this morning and think, well, you know, so-and-so is a really good witness and, and I can't be. We're all called to be witnesses. And we can all witness. I just want to encourage you. Not just a few of us. Um, goodness me, I need to move a little faster. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, just, um, we just need that the Holy Spirit flow through us. You know, sometimes we sh can share the gospel and it's not a lot of verbal but people are looking at their life. It's not a lot of verbal. Okay? You know, acts of love and service, they stand strong on their own. Who can, who can you show an act of love or give service to this week in a Cinnaboy or surrounding area? Who is it? 
you know, you think about for a moment, there's, there's an act of service or an act, something, expression of love that you can do to someone in this town or surrounding. You can do it. You can be eight or 80 in this room this morning and you can do it. Okay, everyone can do it. Okay, we can all give the acts of love and service. You know, I, I just, I make this comment. You know, it's too bad, but senior people tend to kind of drift in a mode of expectancy of people doing things for them. No, no, I think if you're alive, you need to be busy in God's kingdom. Yes, busy in his kingdom, serving him with the gifts God's given you and witnessing. You know, we, we don't stop witnessing. We don't stop sharing. We need to see the world through the eyes of Jesus. Jesus saw people through eyes of simplicity. He did nothing for religious effect. Jesus really operated in a low-key manner. He, he was low-key. He was very powerful. And he did very powerful things. He did miraculous things. But he was very low-key. He wasn't, I don't think, he wasn't a rah-rah guy. And it's okay if you're a rah-rah kind of guy. Jesus wasn't that kind of guy. He was a low-key guy. But very powerful in what he did. Very powerful. We need to see people through the eyes of, of their culture. You know, we need to understand the culture. If you're going to reach people, and maybe not so much in Cinnaboy, but even a city like Regina, you know what? It's becoming more of a multicultural city. If you're going to reach people in a certain culture, you've got to stand their own culture. Not knock it, but understand their culture. That's one avenue of, of reaching those people in that area. Jesus saw people where they're, at, where they're at in their life and he met them there. That's just what he did. You know, you think as you leave church today, you think of some of your contacts and where people are at and just meet them where they're at. You know, that's all you need to do. You know, I, I took, a, a, some time ago, I took a course on alcoholism for my addiction. I'm just joking. <laughs> why did I take it? You know why I took it? So I could understand more about alcoholics. That's why I took it. So when I'm talking to an alcoholic, I, I don't say to them, well, you shouldn't be drinking. I, I, I come from a different perspective. You know, and the same applies with a lot of other addictions. But I did it so I could understand the alcoholic. You know what? For any of you to take that kind of course, you all meet alcoholics. But how, what do you say to them? You think, I don't know what to say to this alcoholic. Other than Jesus, you need Jesus, which is true. But, but maybe they need, they need something else, another different kind of connection. You just, so take what you can that helps you to reach people. You know, Jesus saw people through the eyes of mercy. He cared for all people. He cared for the rich, and he cared for the poor, all people. You know, occasionally I see someone, or I'm around someone that really bugs me. Maybe they're at one of those extra grace required people. <laughs> Do you have any in this church? <laughs> you know what? And I just say, you know what? God, they're, they're as valuable and they're worth as much as myself or anyone else in this church. They are, whether I think it and whether it irritate me or bugging me or someone else, they are valuable in your kingdom. But Jesus had mercy on the rich and upon the poor. You know, and I just know you can walk out these doors and you can have mercy on people out there that need mercy because Jesus gave mercy to people. Be committed to care for the needs of people. Jesus brought God's love to a broken world. How broke is our world in 2015? It's pretty broken. It's pretty broken. And we as the church, we're the church, we're the good news. We can bring love to broken people. Isn't that exciting? And we all can do that. It's not just like a certain age group. The young people, you can bring God's love to other broken young people. And, and young people, you know other young people that are broken. You can bring God's love. For you young couples, you can bring God's love to other young couples that are broken. 
and there's many, and so on. We just keep going. There's so many people that we can just show. One other thing, and then, and then I'll, I'll quit. Going on, verses 16 and 17, in this passage, uh, it talks about, I'll just read those verses. Uh, no one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth in old garment for that, for the patch will pull away from the garment, and the tear is made worse. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break and the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. So you know, that's, that's quite interesting. So he talks about, he gives two illustrations, Jesus does, and he says you don't take a piece of new garment, unshrunk garment, and put on an old garment. Then he says, you don't take new wine and put it into an old wineskin. Gives two illustrations. I want to ask you this. What does an old garment and what does an old wineskin have in common? Anybody? <laughs> I'm sorry. What did I hear over here? They're all, okay, that's one thing. They're all, what else about them? They're all what? Stretched out. Okay. So stretched out. <laughs> Dried out. You know what? You're, you're, you're going the right direction. They're inflexible. They're inflexible. You know, um, uh, Judaism of that day, going back in that period of time when this was written, uh, Judaism was one of rigidity, ritual, and legalism. It was. You know, and Judaism is quite a bit the same way today. You know, there's still a rigidity and, and, and that. So, but, so Jesus gives that illustration. You know, God's grace is, a great, is the opposite of legalism. We need to be full of God's grace. You know, and again, I keep saying, I can see times legalism is creeping in on me. You know, it's just creeping in. It's like a cancer. Most, I, no, no. I don't want to be legalistic with people. I want to show them God's grace. God, I want to be filled with your grace, not legalism. And I don't know about you, but I struggle. All of a sudden, it feels like it's creeping in on me. And I can, I can respond very legalistic. I don't want it. You know, there, there's, there's something about us. Just being flexible. Being filled with God's grace. Hebrews 13, 6 says, Don't be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it's good that your heart be established in grace. It's good that our heart is established in grace. I pray that your hearts this morning in a Cinnaboy Apostolic Church are established in grace. And may the legalism, may any ritual fall off, and that your heart would be established in grace. And you can give grace to others. Rigidity, legalism keeps us from being what Jesus wants us to be. Evangelism models sometimes are too rigid, and they're even sometimes they can be too legal. And they keep us from successfully doing evangelism. You know what? Um, we need to have, be flexible in our evangelism outreach, in our presentation. And flexible in doing ministry in the church. I think you are as a church. I think you've gone, you know, I think you as a church are really a new wineskin. I think you are. You're flexible. But maybe in the area of evangelism, maybe you need to become a new wineskin where you're flexible. Flexible in how you connect and how you reach and how you touch other people. You know, and, and that's so important. Um... You know, Jesus, I'm going to conclude, but Jesus was never too busy to spend time with people. Dr. Gary, Gary Smalley says something I, I really like. He says this, life is all about relationships. The rest is just details. Life is all about relationships. The rest is just details. Our relationship with God, relationship with one another. It's not about the stuff. We get so focused, and it's all about our stuff. We don't have time for others in the body of Christ. We don't have time to connect with the pre-Christian because we're too busy with the stuff. You know, some of us need to get rid of some of our stuff, I think. <laughs> you know, with us moving, we had to get rid of some of our stuff. That's good. 
I still think we don't need all the stuff we got because life is about relationships. All about relationships. Let's make a place in our lives for the pre-Christian. Let's make place. I just pray this morning that you as a church body, everyone that's, that calls this your church home, make a place in your life, make time for the pre-Christian. You know what? That's going to take effort. That's going to take thought of how you do it. You're going to have to pray about it. It's going to take risk of being misunderstood, maybe rejected. It's risk. But God did not call us to live a safe life. He called us to live an exciting life. Okay? And, and I just want to say that as you choose to reach out, God will give you wisdom and strength to do it. Let's leave our comfort zone. Let's be committed. As you leave church today, say, God, I'm not going to stay in the comfort zone. I'm going to leave my comfort zone. I, I want to be connected to a needy world. There's no impact without contact. Let me pray. Father, I just pray today for your people. Lord, I thank you for every person in this church. Lord, I thank you for their pursuit after you. And Lord, I pray today, I pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, your Holy Spirit, as I've been speaking, that you've been stirring, that you've been causing a stirring within their hearts. Lord, for them to um, reach out in, in natural ways, Lord, to others, Lord, that would be in the community, their neighbor or whoever it is, someone at work. Lord, I pray. I pray, Heavenly Father, even as they would go to work or they would connect with people tomorrow. Lord, I pray that you would give them a, a special opportunity. And, and I just feel this this morning. I, I just feel like for, for, for you that it's really burning your heart, I want you to stand this morning. And I, I want to pray especially for you that it's burning your heart, that you want to reach a needy world, that you'll stand right now and I want to pray with you. Okay. Hallelujah. Father, I pray for all these that are standing. Lord, I, I pray that your passion, I pray that your love, oh God, grows deeper in their heart. I pray that the, the burden for the lost and the hurting, Lord, I pray, oh God, that, that, that you would just do a work in their heart today. I pray, oh God, that it would go deeper with the innermost being. Lord, I pray that you would show them unique ways how they can share love with others. Lord, I pray that they would leave here not with a heaviness in their heart, but an excitement, Lord, of what they can do for your kingdom's sake. I pray that this day, and Father, we just give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.